Okay, let's talk about John. Um, John, at least <laughs> this John chapter, like a lot of the stuff in these early chapters, is heavily retconned. Um, the John we know and love later on is very different from this character. This character is known for his observation skills and his incredible memory and things like this. Um, and even being um, hot headed. And not that John doesn't have hot headed moments later on, but we kind of associate those hot headed moments with, um, uh, you know, the dire wolf or, you know, something, him being maybe drunk at the end. Um, there's, there's, uh, you know, and later we, we kind of associate John's character with being compassionate. Uh, that's his strength is his compassion. But here it's, it's, it's a very different John. Um, and, also, the language of this John, I would even say, is very, very simple. Uh, later on, John chapters aren't necessarily this this simple, but when you compare it to, say, Catalan, like it's just ev almost every sen almost every sentence in this John chapter begins with just it's just kind of subject verb object. Sometimes, almost always, beginning with he or John. Um, very different than, say, if we went back to Catalan, like how Catalan structures a sentence. I'm just going to pick, um, pick something random here. Um, um, let's see, you know, like it took, it took Ned a moment to comprehend her words, but when the understanding came, the darkness left his eyes. You know, you, you could say very, very, you know, flatly, like Ned, Ned took a while to comprehend it, but she, she, you know, it's very roundabout and flowery. John, John is very direct in this, in this chapter, strikingly so, but it's, um, and we'll run into a lot of things that just have certainly been changed, but let, anyway, let's get going. Um, there were times, not many, but a few, when Jon Snow was glad he was a bastard. As he filled his wine cup once more from a passing flagon, it struck him that this might be one of them. He settled in, in his place on the bench among the younger squires and drank. The sweet, fruity taste of summer wine uh, filled his mouth and brought a smile to his lips. The great hall of Winterfell was hazy with smoke and heavy with the smell of roasted meat and fresh-baked bread. Its stone grain... Its, stone, its gray stone walls were draped with banners, white, gold, crimson, the direwolf of Stark, Baratheon's crowned stag, the Lion of Lannister. A singer was playing the high harp and recited a ballad, but down at the end of the hall, his voice could scarcely be heard above the roar of the fire, the clangor of, of pewter plates and cups, uh, and the, uh, the low mutter of a hundred drunken conversations. It was the fourth hour of the welcoming feast laid for the king. John's brothers and sisters had been seated with the royal children beneath the raised platforms where uh, Lord and Lady Stark ho uh, hosted the king and queen. In honor of the occasion, his lord father would doubtless permit each, glass uh, each child a glass of wine, but no more than that. Down here on the benches, there was no one to stop John from drinking as much as he had a thirst for. Um <clears throat> And you know it's 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 description, it's it's setting, but you know it's it's not too flowery. It's not that there isn't a few things here and there, but it's very direct. It's very direct. Um, and we're not hearing you know all sorts of background on history or anything like that. It's a it's a fairly straightforward chapter. Probably you know maybe as straightforward as Bran, which is you know Bran as a child. Um. As he was finding that he had a man's thirst, the raucous delight of the youths around him, who ur um, to the raucous delight of the youths around him, who urged him on uh, every time to drain his to drain a glass, they were fine company, and John relished the stories they were telling, tales of battle and betting and the hunt. It was certainly it was certain that his companions were more entertaining than the king's offspring. Now I wanted like think about how simple that is. Like it's not like. You, it's not like George is um, describing a, a youth telling a story or what that story is. He could have done all sorts of colorful stuff here, but instead it's just, 
it was a ruckus delight and they were telling great stories like it's you know it's so it's so it's so uh direct and and minimal uh minimalist um <clears throat> It's, it's, I mean, as they say, it's very tell not show, which is strange. You know, he was certain that the, um, he had uh, sated his curiosity about the visitors when they made their entrance. The procession had passed not a foot from the, the place he had been given on a bench, on the bench. And John had gotten a good look, had, um, I'm really having a tough time speaking today. And John had gotten a good look, a long, good, a long look at them. Um, so John is, 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 is of course, sitting in the back because he's a bastard and uh Catalan thought that this was this was going to be a problem the this again gets back to sort of the the prologue and the huge um disconnect between bastards and royalty it's 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 what happens in ice and fire is certainly overstated from what happens in history yes bastards um you know had we're, we're not considered the same as as trueborn in, in the real world, but they weren't abandoned either. And there were pl examples of plenty of bastards who, you know, achieved noble status. I mean, William the Conqueror was a was a bastard, you know, <laughs> like and and, um, you know, there, there are several others during the, the uh, War of the Roses period that, you know, took on, you know, Duke and um, royal status with the lands and things like that. So this this premise, and even even late even later in Ice and Fire, it this idea is abandoned. You know, like John is sitting here thinking it's hopeless for him. It's hopeless. He has no future except for the Night's Watch. But we meet all sorts of bastards through the story, who you know, Black Walder, for example, or or Ramsay Snow, who are given pretty great responsibilities for for being bastards. Um, and you could say, well, you know, with with Ramsay, his siblings were were gone. But well, you know, Black Walder, Black Walder is, you know, given plenty, <laughs> and he has a lot of brothers and sisters and cousins and whatever. Um, <clears throat> and even later on, this is retcon. We find out that the Ned had this dream for spring idea, uh, where he was going to give him a hold fast in the reach, and I mean, not in the reach, in the uh, in the gift, and so it's kind of all. The, the very meaning, the very reason that John wants to join the Night's Watch has been retconned out. Um, um, his Lord Father had come first, escorting the Queen. She was as beautiful as men said. A jeweled tiara gleamed against her long golden hair. Its emeralds a perfect match for the Queen, for the green of her eyes. <clears throat> George always joked that like he, he mentions people's eyes eye color all the time and we can't really tell people's eye color from very far away. You have to like really go up to somebody and be like, oh, what are you, what's your eye color? But like people noticing eye color from across the room is ridiculous. Um, I guess they pass not a foot from, from his place, but still. <laughs> his father helped her up the steps to the dais and led her to her seat. And the queen never so much as looked at him. Even at 14, John could see through her smile because this chapter is all about how John is so observant, which is something that is abandoned as a as a element of John. John is, you know, in a dance with dragons, John is not as not observant at all. Um, next had come King Robert himself with Lady Stark on his arm. The king was a great disappointment to john his father had talked of him so often of often the, the peerless robert baratheon demon of the trident the fiercest warrior of the realm a giant among princes john only saw john saw only a fat man red-faced under his beard sweating through his silks he walked like a man half in his cups after them came the trip the children little rickon first managing the long walk with all the dignity a three-year-old could muster john had urged him John had urged him on when he stopped to visit. Close behind came Rob in gray wool trim, trimmed with white, the stark colors. He had the Princess Marcella on on his arm. She was a wasp. Uh, she was a wisp of a girl, not quite eight. Her hair a cascade of golden curls under a jeweled net. John noticed the shy looks she gave Rob, 
as they passed between the tables and the timid way she smiled at him. He decided she was insipid. Rob didn't even have the sense to realize how stupid she was. He was grinning like a fool. Um, I always thought this was a weird line. Later, later we're told that, um, you know, Marcella is, is brighter than, than Tommen and, um, and I don't know. She, she's, Marcella is also a little more, uh, rambunctious, but this idea that from looking at her, she's insipid, uh, meaning like she's just, she's dull, um, is kind of weird. And it's also weird that Rob, a boy of 13 or 14 would be, would be flattered by an, an eight year old cooing over him. It's kind of, it, it's, it's really weird. Now, now granted that the ages were, were changed around a bit. So Rob, you know, when this was originally written, Rob was only maybe 12 and John was only 12, you know, but still it's, it's kind of, it's kind of an odd thing. Um, I mean, it's something never explored again. Like it's never explored that Marcella is dull or that Rob was like, you know, liking the fact that this eight year old was, was, you know, into him. Um, his half sisters escorted the Royal princess, uh, the Royal princes, Aria was paired with the plump young Tommen, whose white blonde hair was longer than hers. Sansa, two years older, drew the crown prince, Joffrey Baratheon. He was 12, younger than Rob or, uh, John or Rob, but taller than, than either, to John's vast dismay. Prince Joffrey uh, had his sister's hair and his mother's deep green eyes. A thick tangle of blonde curls uh, dripped down past the golden choker and the high velvet collar. Sansa looked radiant as she walked beside him, but John did not like jo Joffrey's pouty lips or the bored, disdainful way he looked at Winterfell's Great Hall. He was more interested in the pair that came behind him, the Queen's brothers, the Lannisters of Casterly Rock. By the way, just like looking at all of this, he, you know, he, 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 like every sentence, it's so, uh, it's, I would say almost unheard of later on for George R. R. Martin to write this way. Um, the lion and the imp. There was no mistaking which was which. Jamie Lannister was twin to, to Queen Cersei, tall and golden, with flashing green eyes and a smile that cut like a knife. Um, unusually poetic for this chapter. <laughs> a smile that cut like a knife. He wore crimson silk, high black boots, a black satin cloak. On the, on the breast of his uh, tunic, the lion of his house was embroidered in golden thread, roaring in defiance. They called him the Lion of Lannister to his face and whispered Kingslayer behind his back. John, John found it hard to look away from him. This was what a king should look like, he thought to himself as the man passed. A lot of people make a, make a bit about this line. Um, either saying, oh, it's ironic that John is thinking about this because he's eventually going to be some sort of king, whether it be king beyond the wall or king of the north or king king of the seven kingdoms. Um, and that he's calling Jamie a king. In in George's originally original outline, the outline he had when this was written, um, uh, Jamie does become king. He, he, he eventually like kills off. I mean, he, a lot of people die and then he kills off whoever's in line before him, but he, he becomes king of the realm. Um, <clears throat> so maybe this was all foreshadowing of that, or maybe it's just a line about how Jamie, Jamie Lannister looks regal. Then he saw the one other waddling along half hidden by his brother's side. Tyrion Lannister, the youngest of Lord Tywin's brood and by far the ugliest. All the gods had given to all the gods had given to Cersei and Jaime. They denied Tyrion. He was a dwarf, half his half his brother's height, struggling to keep pace on stunted legs. His head was too large for his body, with a brute squashed uh, in face beneath a swollen uh, shelf of a brow. One green eye and one black one peered out from under a lank. Uh, fall of hair so blonde it seemed white john watched him with fascination and a lot of people make make a um a big deal about Tyrion's white hair compared to 
the Lannister golden hair as if maybe he had some sort of, uh, you know, Mad King's blood in him or something, though they described Tommen as having somewhat white hair as well. So I wouldn't read into it too much. Um, they made him... They made him... <clears throat> um, Half the height. I mean, granted, they uh, um, they they made him half the height of Jamie, which is maybe it's an exaggeration, but that's that's kind of ridiculous that he would only be, you know, three feet tall rather than four feet tall. I mean, that and that's a big difference. But you know, he's just kind of maybe he's just rounding by saying half half his brother's height. <clears throat> the last the last of the high lords to enter was his uncle. Benjamin Stark of the Night's Watch and his father and his father's ward, young Theon Greyjoy. Benjamin gave a warm Benjamin gave John a warm smile as he went by. Theon ignored him utterly, but there was nothing new in that. After all, they had, after all had been seated, toasts were made, thanks were given and returned, and uh, returned and the feasting began. And you know, for the most part, this is this is a great introduction to so many of our main characters right here just listing them off in the story and john can do john is you know essentially exposition machine an exposition machine in a very straightforward fashion you know there's nothing uh john had started drinking uh then and he had not stopped something rubbed against his leg beneath the table john saw red eyes staring up at him hungry again he asked there was still half a honeyed chicken at the center of the table John reached off to tear a leg, to tear off a leg, then had a better idea. He knifed the bird whole and let the carcass slide to the floor between his legs. Ghost ripped into it in savage silence. His brothers and sisters had not been permitted to bring their wolves to the banquet, but there were more curs. But there were more there were more curs than John could count at his end of the hall, and no one uh, had said a word about his pup. He told himself he was fortunate in that, too. Um, that's a, a, a cur as a dog. His eyes stung. Rub, John rubbed them savagely, cursing the smoke. He swallowed another gulp of wine and watched his direwolf devour the chicken. I mean, <laughs> it's odd that his eyes, eyes are stinging now after he spent all of this time, like, properly observing all of the people walking in. Now, now the, the smoke is getting to him. Dogs moved between tables, trailing after serving girls. One of them, a black mongrel bitch with a long, with long yellow eyes, caught a scent of the chicken. She stopped at the edge under the bench to get a share. John watched the confrontation. The bitch growled low in her throat and moved closer. Ghost looked up, silent, and fixed the dog with those hot red eyes. The bitch snapped an angry challenge. She was three times the size of the direwolf pup. Ghost did not move he stood over his prize and opened his mouth baring his fangs the bitch tensed barked again then thought better to, of this fight she turned and slunk to, slunk away with one last defiant snap to save her pride ghost went back to his meal we do wonder you know there's there's a little bit of this like like is it just that he's savage with his fangs or is there some other like you know uh extra extra you know supernatural factor going on with the dire wolves john gripped and re uh, reached under the table to ruffle the shaggy white fur the dire wolf looked up at him nipped gently at his hand and went back to eating so you know we're very clearly just going through the characters including ghost itself um you know establishing establishing characters we've, we've established the settings pretty well and now we're going through the characters um, is this one of the dire wolves I've heard so much of? A familiar voice asked, close at hand. John looked up happily at his at his uncle Benjamin, uh, as his uncle Benjamin put a hand on his head and roughed his hair, much as John roughed the wolves. Yes, he said. His name is Ghost. One of the squires interrupted the body story he'd been telling to make room at the table for their lord's brother. Benjamin Stark straddled the bench with long legs, and took the wine cup out of John, out of John's hand. Summer wine, he said after a taste. Nothing so sweet. How many cups have you had, John? John smiled. Ben Stark laughed. As I feared. Ah, well, I believe I was younger than you the first time I got truly and sincerely drunk. 
He snagged a roasted chicken, dripped brown with gravy from a nearby trencher and bit into it. He crunched. Now, <clears throat> now remember, that all, you know, most of these lines were actually written when John was, was supposed to be 12. Um, and so these, these kind of challenging ages, we, we do kind of come, come to it later in the story. Um, you know, for instance, Wex is 12 and Theon thinks that maybe he went to uh, a whorehouse. Uh, Oberyn Martell fathers a child at 12. All sorts of things like that come into the story. Um, but for whatever reasons, you know, George R. Martin decided that with at least with his main characters, he was going to he was going to keep them. Uh, he was going to age them up a little bit. And, you know, his his original plan, <clears throat> George's original plan with the ages was actually to have them have a lot of distance in the story and have each book, you know, take place over a long period of time so that the, the characters could grow up. Um, a Game of Thrones takes place a little over a year, maybe a year and a half. And so you can kind of say, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe the next book would be two years. Next book would take place over two years. You could get, you could get, um, you know, John aged up a little bit, you know? Um, and then after, after George kind of finished A Clash of Kings, which takes place only over a, about six months and A Storm of Swords, A Storm of Swords, which takes place over about four months, um, he kind of realized that the aging up wasn't happening. So he planned this five-year gap where he would just age them all up five years um, in between books. And then that didn't happen. So in our modern story, even though George <laughs> aged them up at the beginning, um, he's now still has the kid, like by, by now in the story, the kid, the characters are still too young for what he wanted originally. His uncle was sharp featured and gaunt as a morning crag. Uh, unusually poetic, but there was uh, always a hint of laughter in his blue-gray eyes. He dressed in black, as befitted a man of the Night's Watch. Tonight it was rich black velvet. This this actually hints back to what Bran was saying, that all he ever sees of Night's Watchmen are them well-dressed, and so when he runs into Garrod, he, he's like, oh, that's unusual. With high leather boots and a wide, wide belt with a silver silver buckle. Uh, a heavy silver chain was looped around his neck. Benjamin watched Ghost with amusement as he ate his onion. A very quiet wolf, he observed. He's not like the others, John said. He, make, he never makes a sound. That's why I call him Ghost. That, and because he's white. The others are all dark, gray, or black. They were gray before, but now we've gotten, we get in the black. So maybe they, they change colors as, as they get older. There are still direwolves beyond the wall. We hear them on our ranging. Uh, ben Stark um, gave John a long look. Don't you usually eat at the table with your brothers? Um, yeah, I mean, this is made this is made uh, a little more explicit. It was implicit before, you know, why John is sitting at the table. He, he kind of established at first because he was a bastard, but now it's even more explicit. Most times. John answered in a flat voice, but tonight Lady Stark thought it might give insult to the royal family to see the bastard among them. I see. His uncle glanced over his shoulder at the, ra uh, at the raised table at the far end of the hall. My brother does not uh, seem very festive tonight. John had noticed that too. John, John is so, John is so uh, observant. <laughs> A bastard had learned to notice things. A bastard had learned to notice things. To read the truth that people hid behind their eyes. That sounds like John. <laughs> that sounds like John Snow. <laughs> I mean, may, you know, maybe it's there to contrast. You know, like uh, you know nothing, John Snow, or whatever. But he completely loses this ability. His father is observing all the courtesies, but there was tightness in him that John had seldom seen before. He said live a little, looking over the hall with hooded eyes, seeing nothing. Um, two seats away, the king was drinking heavily all night. His broad face was flushed behind his great black beard. He made many a toast, laughing loudly at every jest, and attacked each dish like a starving man. But beside him, the queen seemed as cold as ice as a nice sculpture. The queen is angry, too. Um... You know, we're Queen is a nice cold of the night sculpture. I guess we're trying to get others' references here. Um, John told his uncle in a low, quiet voice, Father, 
uh, took the king down to the crypts this afternoon. The queen did not want to, did not want him to go. So you know she's jealous of Liana, even though she doesn't even like Robert. Benjamin gave John a careful measure, measure, careful measuring look. You don't miss much, do you, John? We could use a man like you on the wall. <laughs> that John Snow, <laughs> so observant. John swelled with pride. Rob is strong is is a stronger lance than I am, but I am uh, the better sword. And Holland says I sit a horse as well as anyone in the castle. Um. The comparison to Rob here is interesting because we never find out who is older, Rob or John, or at least who is purportedly older, Rob or John. It's never brought up. There is a previous version <clears throat> of, I think, I, might, I forget if it's Clash or, or, or Storm, where, where George did mention that John was older by like two months. Um, but that was removed. So we don't really know the story. Cause obviously like if you have John be old, like John clearly looks older, Bran said so, but if John is older and, and Ned is married at the beginning of the, at the battle of the bells, like, you know, his the beginning of when he joins the war, um, then, you know, you, you, you immediately out that, that Ned is not the uh the father so like rob the story should be that rob is younger so it's weird that rob that's i mean john the story should be that john is younger but it's weird that john looks older and there's this um you know disparity that's not <clears throat> ever you know explained so we don't know it's still in the story it's never told like what john believes like how john how old does john think he is and why is he why does he look older Anyway, notable achievements. <clears throat> so here they they have been practicing jousting. So that's a uh, even though there there's there's no knights in the north or fewer knights. I mean, obviously, um, Roderick, Sir Roderick, but they're getting taught with these southern things, um, these southern ways. Take me with you. Take me with you when you go back to the wall, John said in a sudden rush. Father will it will give leave give me leave to go if you ask him. I know he will. Uncle Benjamin studied his face carefully. The wall is a hard place for a boy, John. I'm almost a man grown, John protested. I will turn fifteen on my next name day. And Maester Lewin says bastards grow up faster than other children. Maybe this is the 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 strange explanation on why John is is looks older. <clears throat> um but uh you know it's it's a it's a weird even timeline wise like even people that kind of believe that r plus o equals j they still kind of accept that rob must must be younger than uh, i'm sorry john must be younger than rob because if rob is born during the war and around the time of of the um of the sack of king's landing you know, and if if Ned is coming in and getting getting this baby when when Liana's dying in her bed, like it, John must be younger. But we get all these hints that John is older, that John was actually birthed. You know, which still makes sense. Like Liana's kidnapped and impregnated, and he's 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 actually born before Rob. These are all these hints of that. But timeline wise, it doesn't make sense with finding Liana in a bed of blood. Um, Unless, you know, I mean, I guess there might be enough time for her to birth John and then birth a then immediately nine months, have a second one. I don't even know. I don't think so. I don't think there's enough time. I don't think there's enough time for that. But, you know, um, so it just, I don't know. Like I say, the Roberts Rebellion timeline and everything, it just doesn't make sense. So it's fine. Uh, that's true. Benjamin said with a downward twist of his mouth. He took John's cup from uh, from the table, filled filled it fresh uh, from a nearby pitcher, and drank down a, a long swallow. Daron Targaryen, Daron Targaryen was only fourteen when he conquered Dorne. John said the young dragon was the young dragon was one of his heroes. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if we ever hear about John 
like having these nightly heroes again. Maybe. I'll have to keep an eye out for that one. But it doesn't really sound like John, does it? It sounds more like Bran. A conquest that lasted a summer, his uncle pointed out. The Poi King lost 10,000 men taking, taking the place and another 50 trying to hold it. Someone should have told him that the war isn't a game. This is some uh, foreshadowing because later we we hear that everything is a game. It's a game of thrones. <clears throat> he took another sip of wine. Also, he said, wiping his mouth, Daron Targaryen only lived, uh, was only 18 when he died. Or have you forgotten that part? I forget nothing, John boasted. <laughs> it's a funny, it's a funny thing, right? Like this, John is presented as like, it's very clear that, um, you know, take something like the Garrett Waymore Royce, like, uh, like opposition. Like it's very, it's very clear that it's being presented that Waymar shouldn't be leading. Garrett should should be leading because Garrett has better ability, better ability of wisdom, you know. And so now we find that John is actually the the more deserving son than Rob. Is is, is this is this dichotomy again? And it's because John is smarter, more observant, doesn't forget anything, stronger, better better at swordplay, all these sorts of things. Um. But that's kind of, I mean, not that John isn't a great fighter later on, but it's kind of abandoned because John's strength becomes his, like, say, his compassion. That's John's strength, you know, so um, not not his sort of like, you know, uh, his his, ob- his observation skills or his memory. The wine was making him bold. He tried to sit very straight to make himself seem taller. I want to serve the night, serve in the night's watch, uncle. He had thought on it long and hard, lying a bed at night while his brother slept around him. Rob would someday inherit Winterfell, would command great armies as the Warden of the North. Hmm. Bran and Rickon, again, this Warden thing, that kind of a bit, you know, again, kind of an abandoned thing, how important it is. Um, Bran and Rickon would be Rob's bannermen and rule holdfasts in his name. Which holdfasts? <laughs> like, are we talking about the? Are we talking about the gift? You know, like what? What? What is he talking about here? What is he talking about that they, like he he thinks that Brandon Rickon will inherit something like smaller holdfasts as like bannermen. I mean, through daughters. Are we? Is he talking about the gift? Like, you know, obviously George didn't really think this through because. Jon Snow is there too. Like Jon Snow could probably be married off even at, you know as a royal bastard to to somebody a, a minor lord rule a castle with his with his wife, you know, or if the gift is on the table, rule that too. It, it it's you know, like I say this is all just retconned out of here. But and yet Jon is can't be retconned out of the watch. His sisters and Arya, his sisters Arya and Sansa would marry the heirs of other great houses and go south as as mistresses a uh, mistress of castles of their own um so i mean he doesn't say that about robin bran and rickon like they're somehow getting lands and holdfasts in the north but what place would a bastard hope to earn well <laughs> later we find out that <laughs> There was a plan, so none of this, none of this makes sense. I mean, I have my theories about it that that his mind is getting messed with because of ghosts and stuff like this, and he's being completely irrational. But whatever, you know, clearly that wasn't on G- uh, George R. Martin's mind at the time. You don't know what you're asking, John. The Night's Watch is a sworn brotherhood. We have no families. Uh, none of us will ever father sons. Our wife is duty. Our mistress is honor. Um. A lot of exposition here on what the Night's Watch is. A bastard can have honor too. I'm ready to swear your oath. You are a boy of 14, Benjamin said. Not a man, not yet. <clears throat> Until you have known a woman, you cannot understand what you are giving up. Um, this is an interesting kind of, kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> 
because obviously the, this does relate to John's plot with Egret, and maybe this was on on George R. R. Martin's mind. Uh, John knowing a woman and it changing him, but you do wonder like what Benjamin's experience is, and who did he know, and what was he giving up? You know, was it a was it a Charadane? <laughs> Um, I don't, was, was it Liana? <laughs> I don't care about that, John said hotly. You might, if you knew what it meant. If you knew what the oath would cost you, you might be less eager to pay the price, son. John felt anger rise inside him. I'm not your son. It's funny, of all the things that, um, John regrets when, when he goes to the wall, you know, I don't think, you know, relationships and children... I, I think he does mention it once in A Storm of Swords, like when Stannis gives him the offer, offer he thinks about things that uh, that he'd have. But, you know, he doesn't lament it too much. I mean, how much do children, you know, really, you know, how much does a, does a 14, 15, 16 year old really think like, oh, gosh, I really want kids. You know, it's not really on their mind, but but um, it's kind of a disconnect of what Benjamin is like saying to, to John versus what he wants, which I suppose fits the scene. Benjamin Stark stood up. I'm not your son. More's the pity. He put his hand on John's uh, shoulder. Come back to me after you fathered a few bastards of your own and we'll see how you feel. Maybe this is all Benjamin is his dad. Um, John trembled. I will never father a bastard, he said carefully. Never. He spat it out like ven venom. And of course, John, there, there is talk about maybe John have, uh, that maybe Egret was pregnant um, when, when she was killed. Um, and that John's best, you know, any future bastard that, that he had was, was killed there too. So he never fathered one. Suddenly he realized that the table had fallen silent and they were all looking at him. He felt the tears begin to well behind his eyes. He pushed himself to his feet. I must be excused, he said with the, la with <laughs> the last of his dignity. He whirled and bolted before they could see him cry. He must have drunk more wine than he had realized. His feet got tangled under, under him as he tried to leave, and he lurched sideways into a serving girl and sent a flagon of spiced wine, crash to the f spiced wine crashing to the floor. Laughter boomed all around him, and John felt hot tears on his cheeks. Someone tried to steady him. He wrenched free of their grip and ran half blind from the door, ghost followed close at his heels out into the night. The yard was quiet and empty. A lone sentry stood high on the battlements of the inner wall, his, his cloak pulled tight around him against the cold. He looked bored and miserable as he huddled there alone, but John would have traded places with him in an instant. Um, there it is. He's, you know, it's like a, like a, a guarding on the night's watch. Otherwise, the castle was dark and deserted. John had... Uh, seen an abandoned holdfast once, a drear place where nothing uh, moved but the wind and the stones kept silent about whatever people had lived there. Winterfell reminded him of that tonight. Um, you know, which whole, which abandoned holdfast hold or whatever were never really told, but, you know. I mean, I guess they were at an abandoned holdfast in, in, in Bran 1. <clears throat> Um, the sounds of music and song spilled through the open windows behind him, and there was, and were the last things John wanted to hear. He wiped away his tears on the sleeve of his shirt, furious that he had let them fall, and turned to go. Boy, a voice called to him. John turned around. Tyrion Lannister was sitting on the ledge above the door of the great hall, looking for all, looking uh, for all the world like a gargoyle. Um, Lannis Tyrion being compared to a gargoyle is something that happens over and over and over in the story um, a lot of people wonder if this means like he will actually get grayscale and turn to stone or something like that but he is he's he's compared to a gargoyle quite a bit um the dwarf grinned down at him is that is that animal a wolf a dire wolf john said his name is ghost he stared up at the little man his disappointment suddenly forgotten what are you doing up there why aren't you at the feast too hot too noisy and i'd be drunk and i'd drunk too much wine the dwarf told him I learned long ago that it's considered rude to vomit on your brother. Might I have a closer look at your wolf? John hesitated, then nodded slowly. Um, um, 
John hesitated, then nodded slowly. Uh, can you climb down, or shall I bring a ladder? Oh, bleed that, the little man said. He pushed himself off the ledge into empty air. John gasped, then watched with awe as Tyrion Lannister spun around in a tight ball, landed lightly on his hands, then vaulted backward onto his legs. <laughs> now, now Tyrion Lannister, the uh, dwarf acrobat, um, largely retconned out of the story. He does mention in a, in a Dance with Dragons that he was taught some some tumbling by his by his uncle Gary, but um, he never uses this acrobatic skill uh, really ever. You know, for a Clash of Kings, a Storm of Swords, you know, at all. Uh, it's largely taken out of out of the story. He, he's then talked about having stunted legs that can't that can't walk very well, run very well, um, and not this, you know, incredible, um, uh, you know, gymnast. So again, another thing that's just kind of retconned out. John backed away from him uncertain, uh, uncertainly. The dwarf dusted himself off and laughed. I believe I've frightened your wolf. My apologies. He's not scared, John said. He knelt and called out. Ghost, come here. Come on. That's it. Wolf puff, Wolf pup uh, patted closer and nuzzled at John's face, but he kept a wary eye on Tyrion Lannister. And when the dwarf reached out to pet him, he, he drew back and bared his fangs in a silent snarl. Shy, isn't he? Lannister observed. Yes, the dire wolves don't like Tyrion. They do not like Tyrion. Um, and why has not really ever been explored, you know? Is it, you know, why, say, if they're controlled by Bloodraven, they would dislike Tyrion? Why, if they're controlled by a time-traveling Bran, they would dislike Tyrion? Um, keep in mind, George has, when he even says that, that, he was asked specifically, when did you come up with the idea of the Three-Eyed Crow? And he said sometime after he came back from the break, and started thinking about everything like this first dozen chapters or so he didn't really know what story he was writing so like the ghost not liking Tyrion here is there's no there's no real reason at the heart of it i mean george might have a retconned reason that he put in later but when he originally wrote these words he, he was just kind of writing a story and trying to figure out later what it all meant um uh, sit ghost john commanded that's it keep still he looked up at the dwarf you can touch him now. He won't move until I tell him. I've been tra I've been training him. Um, also kind of, there's definitely some moments where the dire wolf is out of control from John. Um, but uh, even though he's trained him, but whatever the case. <laughs> I see, L Lannister said. He roughed the snow white fur between John's uh, ghost's ear and said, nice wolf. If I wasn't here, he'd tear, your <laughs> he'd tear out your throat, John said. It wasn't actually true yet, but it would be. In that case, you had best stay close, the dwarf said. He cocked it, and this gets into other things that, like, as long as we hear this a, a bit, when, when the kids are separated from their dire wolves, like, tragedy happens to them, you know? John puts puts wolf, puts ghost away, gets stabbed. Rob, uh, Grey Wind is put away, he gets stabbed. Um, Sansa doesn't have her dire wolf. Arya doesn't have her dire wolf. Um, the dire wolves are there to protect them. And when the dire wolves aren't around, it's when, it's when bad things happen to them. Um, he cocked his oversized head, uh, to one side and looked John over with his mis mismatched eyes. I'm Tyrion Lannister. I know, John said. He rose, standing, standing, he was, a, he was taller than the dwarf. It made him feel strange. You're Ned Stark's bastard, aren't you? John felt a coldness pa pa pass right through him. He pressed his lips together and said nothing. Did I offend you, Lannister? Did I offend you, Lannister said. Sorry, dwarfs don't have to be tactful. Generations of capering fools and motley have won me the right to dress badly and say any damn thing that comes to my head. He grinned. You are a bastard, though. You can see Tyrion's, Tyrion's personality is very different than later on. He's, he's left, he's, he's direct. He's direct and, and, and brazen, but he's not so clever. He's not constantly making jokes, constantly doing quips, you know. So Tyrion, Tyrion changes a bit over time. Lord Eddard Stark is my father, John admitted stiffly. Lannister studied his face. Yes, uh, he said, I can see it. You have more of the North in you than your brothers. Half brothers, John corrected. Some people would say this like, oh, Stark Cest, Stark Cest. <laughs> She's double, double North, you know. 
half brothers, John corrected. He was pleased by the dwarf's comment, he had, but he had tried not to let it show. Let me give you some counsel, bastard, Lannister said. Never forget who you are, for surely the world were not, will not. Make it your strength, and it can never be your weakness. Armor yourself in it, and it will never be used to hurt you. Of course, this is easier said than done, and I would say that Tyrion is quite a hypocrite here. He gets insulted and hurt all the time about being a dwarf. <laughs> um, John was in no mood for anyone's counsel. What do you know about being a bastard? And of course, John is very unsuccessful in, in armoring himself about being a bastard. All dwarfs are bastards in their father's eyes. You're your mother's trueborn son of Lannister. Am I? The dwarf replied sardonically. This is the, am I? Am I? Am I? Perhaps I'm a bastard. The king's bastard kind of thing. Adding into that theory. Do tell my lord father. My mother died birthing me. And he's never been so, he's never been sure. I didn't even know who my mother was, John said. Some women, no doubt. Most of them are. He favored John with a rueful grin. Remember this boy. All dwarfs may be bastards, but not all bastards need be dwarfs. And with that, he turned and sauntered back into the feast, whistling a tune. When he opened the door, the light from within drew his shadow clear across the yard. And for just a moment, Tyrion Lannister stood as tall as a king. And this is, of course, like the, the joke being... Or, I mean, and this is actually the, the true meaning of, of that line earlier, I think, um, where Jamie Lannister is the one that looks like a king. In the end, John realizes that it's not Jamie Lannister who looks like a king. It's Tyrion who looks like a king. It's Tyrion's like wisdom and advice and and confidence in all of these things. A lot of this is largely abandoned with Tyrion. Tyrion is much more insecure and and um, uh, not quite as wise and giving out wisdom as as people uh, as he is here. Here he is a as he's almost you know a Yoda seer kind of character here with his knowledge and his confidence. Granted, he's talking to a fourteen year old kid, so maybe that's it. But um, but this is the true meaning. I mean, yes, Jamie does become a king, or in the in the the outline, Jamie becomes king, and yeah, people have their beliefs about John becoming king and the irony of that, but. No, I think that like the real meaning of Jamie looked like a king comes back here in the end that no, Tyrion Lannister doesn't look like a king, but he stood tall as a king. I think that's the often forgotten about real meaning of what that phrase means. A very talked about phrase like Jamie, Jamie looked like a king. Well, yeah, you're forgetting the rest of the chapter. It's Tyrion that, st that stands as tall as a king. But um, anyway... <clears throat> So far, this is the simplest chapter that we've had so far. Simplest language, even compared to even compared to that brand chapter. I mean, it's maybe it's not, maybe the, the brand chapter's language is a little simpler. But this is a very simple, straightforward, not that much world building introduction to all of our characters very briefly, um, and and learning about the Night's Watch. But for the most part, uh, a a swift and breezy chapter with um, you know. Not that just the constant world building that we saw in the previous chapters where it's just like line after line after line cramming in, cramming in stuff. This one's a, a fairly simple, uh, straightforward chapter that, you know, to establish John and Tyrion and, you know, the other characters a, a little bit. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of retcons. <laughs> there's a lot of retcons, but still, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a nice meeting. It's a certainly nice, uh, nice chapter here. Even if so much of John's and Tyrion's personalities are retconned out, and Tyrion is no longer a uh, gymnastic dwarf. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's that, um, and we'll continue on uh, more later. Okay.